There we go. Okay. Chat. So, um, we're here, I hope, I think. Something weird is going on with the YouTube live stream function. But here we are. Um, I don't see anybody here yet. For some reason, um, I have to pop out the chat to get it to work, and I had to uh, delete the original stream that was supposed to happen and create a new one, and here we are. Um, let me know if you're... Okay, so we're waiting for people to come. Uh, we're here every week, uh, Sunday, 11.30 California time. So you can be here next time if you missed the stream. Really don't know what's going on with the stream, though. This is weird. Hmm. Okay, wait for somebody to get in here and let me know that things are working. So I might just be talking to myself. Hopefully the mic is working. Bring up some recent comments. Um, this is so annoying. Um, yes. No, that's not what I want. Okay. Um, comments. Oh, yeah, I don't have to do that. That's actually kind of useful. Um, hold for review. Okay, so yeah, big intonation lesson coming. Um, realized some interesting things about intonation. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, it says I'm live. That's good. Um, it's kind of frustrating. Okay. Um, good questions. Good questions. Don't see any. Uh, one person was asking about the um, pronunciation of D and R, like in dream. Or dream. Uh, so we could talk a little bit about that. I guess I'll just start with that and we'll see who comes in. Um, God, this is annoying. Let me come over here. Uh, let's see here. Currently streaming. Had to delete the. Start. Um, not sure if the current column is properly. I and say hi. Not know what's going on with YouTube. This is so annoying. <sighs> okay. Um, guess I'll cut the start of this live stream. Um, hmm. What is that? Uh, I need somebody to let me know if this is working. Feel free to say hi, ask a question. That's what we're here for. Um, so there was a, someone recently asked about pronunciation of D and R together, like in this word, for example. Um, 
and it seems that they're probably a native speaker. Um, but uh, they said that they usually say dream with a D uh, and they were asking about um, if I could provide an explanation for dream because um, they can also imagine saying it that way sometimes. And so we can go into that if you guys want. Um, I've talked about that combination before, but um, the D can turn into a J. Um, I talked recently about picking your parents, which is a very useful idea. God, this is not normal. There's nobody here. I'm so confused. Seems to be working. There I am. Wow, that's a big lag. What's going on? Interesting. Okay. Um, I really need to know if this is working. There's nobody here for some reason, which is really weird. Finally, somebody is here. Okay, good. Mariana, thank you for letting me know. Um, usually we have more people and the chat is being weird. Things are, I just, I just, I'm really confused. So, I don't know. Um, but yes, thank you for coming by and letting me know it's working. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, we can start talking about stuff, but I really want to know what is going on with YouTube. YouTube live stream not working correctly. Um, even if you're here, um, we usually have at least three or four more people by now. So I don't know if there's an issue with like the other stream it hasn't been deleted yet or what's going on. But let's see here. Okay, um, no, no, no. Hmm. Yeah, definitely something wrong, that's for sure. Um, let's see. Hmm. Well, with nobody here asking questions, I don't have anything to talk about. I mean, I do. I could talk about some stuff, but... Um, I don't want to give away the surprise for the upcoming intonation lesson. Let's see, that's off. What could be causing this problem? Here we go. Send feedback. Um, what just happened? Come on, happen. That was weird. Oh, I see. That, okay, cancel. That's not what I wanted. Edit. Oh, there's a 
Station. Why is there not more people here? Maybe everybody just doesn't love me anymore. So sad. Um, let's see. There's a headache. Big headache. So this live stream is brought to you by technical problems. You get to see how a native speaker mutters to themselves as they try to fix a problem that they don't know how to fix. Real life exposure. <laughs> um, content live. Okay, it's working. It says live now. Still only one viewer. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what to do, what to do. Well, Mariana, if you're still here, um, hey, we have another person. Delio. Am I the only one here? Uh, well, there's. it says there's two people here. I assume Mariana is still here. Um, so there's there's some weird issue going on. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know if like you just jumped on and you're like, hey, let me join the stream. Or if you had any technical difficulties trying to join the stream. Um, when I first started trying to stream, there's a one that I had pre-programmed um, that was, you know, ready for today. But when I go into the live screen or live stream thing, usually the chat is available. I had to pop out the chat in a separate window for it to work because otherwise I can't access the chat and it just, it wouldn't load the live stream. It would just say like, you know, going live and then it would never go live. So I deleted that, started a new one and I don't know what's going on with like on the, the back end or if it's something with my browser or what um because usually we have a lot more people by now um so i'm going to assume that it's working because we got a couple people in here but i don't know what's going on um there also seems to be quite a bit of lag because i i loaded the stream on my phone and there's like a five second lag <laughs> um so that might be normal though. I don't know. I don't usually watch myself. Um, that is trash. So anyway, um, let me know if you have questions. Uh, I know you usually do, Delio. Um, but until we get some questions, I don't really have a whole lot to bring up because the recent questions, there's not a whole lot in the recent questions or questions and comments. Um, I could talk a little bit about the upcoming intonation lesson, but I don't want to spoil it. Um, if you want me to talk about it, I can. But otherwise, you know, what do you guys want to know? Looks like we have three people here now, according to the little number icon I see. Um, just really confused why this is acting weird. Do 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 do. Anyway, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to do. Where did that go? Oh, I closed the wrong tab, that's why. Community. Okay. So, it's like the most boring live stream ever. 
because there's nobody here to ask me questions. Nobody's asking questions. Um, yeah, it's an intonation thing, though. It's kind of amazing. Um, I'm having a little bit of an issue because uh, I decided, oh, I decided to uh, just like go really like do a super deep dive. Um, what is that? Yeah, do a super deep dive uh, in terms of research because I wanted to see. I know obviously like intonation is. Um, very abstract. Uh, it's relatively not talked about as much because it's hard to teach. Um, so I wanted to see actually what, like how other teachers teach it and um, what they actually cover in intonation because there's different aspects to intonation. I've seen some people, they just talk about like the sentence final intonation. Some people talk more about like actually shifting the focus word and stuff. And um, I haven't seen a, a lesson from anybody that seems complete um, or that seems like it, it really, like it just covers maybe part of intonation. And even then, sometimes I'm kind of like, eh, is that really accurate? Is that really right? That seems weird. Um, so some of it's good, some of it's bad, but um, I think you guys are going to be very happy with, uh, hello. Shok, Shauk. I don't know how to say your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> Shok you. Shok. Uh, yes, welcome, welcome. Let me know if you have questions. That's what we're here for. I'm kind of just trying to uh, talk so that <laughs> we're not sitting here bored. Um, but yeah, so for this particular lesson, usually I don't do a whole lot of research on like the way other teachers teach it. Um, sometimes I like to do that just because I want to see... Um, if there are holes in the way other people teach it, like if they, you know, or, or just like the way they present the information. Um, Cause me, I'd, I'll, I'll get asked by students like, Oh, Hey, there's this video from this teacher. Can you like check it out and blah, blah, blah. And so I'll look at it a lot, a lot of the times. I mean, there's some good teachers out there, but probably half the time um, I either, whether it's about, I'm not talking about just intonation, just in general for English. Um, I either disagree to some extent with what they're saying or how they're saying it because I'm like, well, that could be misleading or blah, blah, blah. Um, or it just, it seems like they're leaving out important information, uh, maybe intentionally, maybe not. I don't know. Um, so that seems to be kind of common, uh, which might be one reason why you guys like me because... I try to cover everything. <laughs> I might do it in, in a series of videos instead of all just in one big video, but um, you know, I don't want to give you guys like partial information where it's like, oh, this is this. And then like, I never talk about it again because like the other part is difficult <laughs> to talk about. It's like, well, you'll figure it out. Um, but anyway. Still no questions, guys. Come on. It's what we're here for. We're here to answer your questions. And if there are no questions, then there is nothing for me to answer. Um, or if you just want to say hi, just say hi. That's fine, I guess. <laughs> Greetings from the United States. Okay. So... This live stream brought to you by native speaker being awkwardly weird as he has nothing to talk about. Um, key concepts. I suppose I can lay out um, not, I don't want to give away the big discovery that I made about intonation, um, but I can tell you a bit about uh, Something that, it, I mean, it's directly related, but it's um, certain concepts that I'm going to be laying out in the lesson that aren't actually about the discovery itself. It's just sort of in general. So I guess I can lay that out while we're here since nobody has any questions. 
Um, and this is still technically in the works. Um, I haven't solidified completely everything. Uh, but there are basically um, three types of intonation, three types of intonation. And this is going to start making a lot more sense because usually when teachers talk about intonation, they just talk about intonation, right? They might say, well, okay, there's sentence final intonation. Um, and they might say, well, okay, you can add emotion to things. And it's like, okay, well, it all seems very eh. Right? Like it's either limited or it's very abstract and intonation by nature is kind of that way because it's very dependent on context. Um, I actually tried to break down intonation patterns related to the sort of mainstream American accent going beyond the run of the mill patterns for questions and statements. Well, that's good. That's actually kind of what I'm trying to do and in, in, to, to some extent. Um, but I'm also a native, so you know, <laughs> I have a whole internal database that I can sort of crunch uh, in my subconscious. Um, but there are three types of intonation. There is um, what I'm calling structural intonation. And that has to do whether it's sentence final or not sentence final. Um, that has to do with like, it's, it's sort of really tied to the grammar um, so like if you have a period, if you have a comma, if you have an exclamation point, um, if you have a, like a list of things, there's, you know, we either go up, we go down, whatever. This is just the basic little structural intonation of the language. And there you go. It, it's, it's, um, it's more or less concrete. It has pretty set patterns and that's what it is. Um, so that's the first kind. Um, we have uh, Pascal here. Sorry if I said that horribly. Um, Pascal. I have no idea how to pronounce it. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same as in English. We'd probably say Pascal, um, but that's probably not how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, hi, I live in Seattle, and I really want to sound like a native. Some people said the way I pronounce words is excellent, but the musicality or something is different. I guess the intonation. Uh, yes, so very likely intonation is um, either all or at least a big part of the problem. Um, and I'm going to be trying to address that in this next big upcoming lesson uh, that I'm working on. Uh, but there's more than, than just that. Uh, I really wish sometimes I could just like, because I can like literally draw things out for you guys, but how I see things in my head would just, if I could just like beam that graphic into your mind, you'd be like, oh my God, it's amazing. But no, oh, <laughs> you pronounce my name just fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, there's sort of a, a broad overview of, of how the spoken language works. And this is directly applicable to pronunciation. If you think of an upside down pyramid, which I've talked about before in a live stream, I'm, I'm probably going to make a video about that at some point. Brandon is here. Welcome, Brandon. Um, I was talking a little bit about the, the uh, exchange we had in the comments um, towards the beginning of the stream. But um, anyway, so upside down pyramid, um, it's a universal skill pyramid that applies to all skills. You can map all skills. Um, that's something I would be talking about on my more on my second channel when I get back to actually making videos for that channel, which I have not done for a long time. Um, so there's upside down skill pyramid and at the root level, there's the root element, what I call the Miyagi element uh, from Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid. Um, and it's sort of that lowest fundamental unit of a skill that um, perhaps seems either way too simple, like you shouldn't really waste your time on it because it's just clearly too easy, or it doesn't really seem relevant. It doesn't seem like it would be useful um, in any way to like go to that level. Um, and yet this is the key level. Like you can go even farther. Um, this, the pinpoint of this is usually academics and it's, it's like too far down. Um, so I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I haven't talked about the pyramid in a while. It's all like subconscious to me right now. But anyway, there's this there's this lowest point in spoken languages that is the um, 
the sounds, the individual sounds that you create. Now, the other pyramid that goes down like this, which is more academic, right? This is like the academic pyramid, the skill pyramid, um, roughly, more or less. It's how I like to picture it. But um, if you go lower, uh, right, we could talk about like the actual waves, like sound waves, which is not useful or practical at all for language learning. Like it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I mean, we can maybe talk about like, okay, let's look at audacity and see how the sound waves move. Maybe you can get some stuff out of that, but it's, it's, it's not going to do a whole lot for you. Um, so we're talking about like the individual sounds themselves, not the waves of the sounds, but like, okay, there's E, there's E, there's A, there's T, SH, whatever. Okay. So that's the basic building blocks of spoken language, right? Sounds makes sense. Um, in written language, it's symbols or characters, letters, right? So there's two different things, two different um, modes of language. There's also sign language, of course, um, which is another form of spoken language. Just instead of making sounds, you're making signs, um, which is also perfectly valid. But most of the time we're talking about spoken and written language, specifically spoken language, because people want to learn how to speak a language, um, which is why in traditional uh, language teaching, one of the biggest problems is they focus a lot on writing, they focus a lot on reading, maybe you'll get uh, quite a bit of listening, not really any speaking. And yet, if you want to speak the language, you got to practice speaking it. So anyway, that's a different topic. Point is, is that at the bottom of this pyramid is the individual sounds. Now those sounds, as you go up the pyramid, right, it's an upside down pyramid, as you go up, right, those sounds start linking together into syllables, which then link together into words, which then link together into sentences, phrases and sentences, which then link together into compound sentences and on and on and on. You can keep going all the way up to like, in terms of spoken language, it would be a speech in terms of written language. Um, we go characters still into syllables, into words, just through the visual medium instead of the, the auditory medium. Um, and you can go all the way up to like a novel in, in the written language. Okay. So um, there's a, a sort of practical scope in terms of what we want to do, because um, not everybody wants to write a book, right, or give a speech. Um, that's a little too high level, right? It's too much language. We don't care that 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 far. So you have the individual unit at the bottom of the pyramid, up to about compound sentences. That's the point where it starts to break off and become less useful. Maybe paragraphs, um, especially in the written language. But in the spoken language, we're really concerned with like, okay, how do you construct? you know, sentences, maybe build slightly more complex ideas, but for like a whole paragraph in speech, maybe if you're really high level and you're trying to, you know, make your language a bit more sophisticated, might be useful, more of an advanced thing. Um, okay, so why did I mention all that? <laughs> there was a reason. Oh, yes. Uh, because so uh, I think what Pascal was saying in which is now a retracted message for some reason. Um, the, the point is that uh, at the lowest level, we're talking about the sounds. Um, that's very mechanical, right? There's your ability to perceive those sounds and produce those sounds. But as we go up the chain and we get into syllables and words, we start getting into stress. Stress is not so mechanical. There's obviously, you know, ways that you can, um, you know, increase the, the volume on a particular sound or group of sounds, right? We call it stress, um, increase the loudness and or length in a stress time language like English, it's going to be the uh, loudness and the length in a syllable timed, so, yeah, syllable time language like Spanish, it's just going to be the loudness. Um, but either way, there are physical mechanics that work there, but we don't really care as much about that because that's a little more intuitive. You kind of know how to stress things, you make them louder, right? Um, it's not as big of a, a deal as that lower foundational level. Um, and then of course, on top of that, we have intonation, rhythm, okay? So once you start getting, okay, this is a stress, 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 unstress, unstress, stress, you start chaining the stress and unstress together and you get, instead of the sound level, instead of the syllable level, instead of the word level, once you get up to the sentence level, now you have another little world that you're working with. And this is where the rhythm and intonation exists, right? It's another layer on top of the words, on top of the syllables, on top of the sounds. Um, so each level up the chain uh, through the spoken language uh, has its own little 
details, has its own little techniques, has its own um, things to focus on. So like, again, the sound level at the base is very mechanical. It's very much based on, can you perceive the sounds? Can you produce the sounds? What do you do with your tongue? How do you hold this? How do you hold that? Where when you're doing intonation, um, that's a lot more abstract by nature, right? Because we're talking about like, okay, in the flow of a whole sentence, what do I do at the end? You know, what do I do? Like if I'm angry, you know, how do I, how do I sound angry through a whole sentence or whatever, right? Just simple, stupid example, but, um, right. It's not so much that mechanical aspect anymore. It's more the, the sort of abstract way that you're manipulating the, the, the flow of the sounds instead of the actual production of the sounds themselves, because the, the sounds themselves are still there, right? Like I could say, I like dogs. I like dogs. I like dogs, right? Sounds are the same. <laughs> I'm putting the same stream of sounds together. Maybe there's a little bit of variation in them based on how, you know, if I'm angry, maybe my mouth is a little more closed, a little more tense. But for the most part, all the sounds are there. All the words are there. All the syllables are there. But you can now get, say, if it's an emotional effect, you can get a whole lot more information out of just the words through this higher level of the, the intonation and the rhythm. Um, so that's how you kind of want to think of it, right? As it sort of stacks up and becomes more and more complex as it organizes itself into greater and greater whole units. And that's an important idea, whole units, because at the sentence level, um, which could be a phrase or a sentence, it doesn't really matter. But, um, when we get to compound sentences, it starts to get a little bit, a little bit weird. But if we just think of, you know, simple sentences to keep things simple, we have a phrase or a simple sentence, um, that acts sort of of like a big word in 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 some sense um because it's a whole idea it's a whole unit um so just like i like dogs each of those are units that contain some information i like dogs put together now creates a whole other unit where i'm saying okay i am the person who likes what dogs right it's not you like dogs or he likes cats or he hates people right so that sentence is now one whole complete unit um, that communicates information that is composed of the pieces, but also greater than the pieces. Um, and this is probably way over everybody's head, but if you know anything about, say, Alfred, uh, I think his name is Alfred North Whitehead or something like that, uh, philosophy guy from like 50, 50, 60, 70 years ago, somewhere around there. Um, or Ken Wilber talking about holons, things like that. Um, there's a lot in the background that has informed my perspective of things that you guys never need to hear about. <laughs> um, my original education, I have, I have a degree in philosophy. Um, so yeah, that's probably one reason why I, I teach in a different way than a lot of other people. Um, but anyway, that's not the point. Um, so Delio, uh, sorry, it took me a second to get here. I actually tried to break, oh, I already got that one. Um, there was another one. Okay. I came up with symbols for the different intonation patterns I noticed, but soon enough I got overwhelmed by it all. And I gave up just banked on the idea of picking it up through immersion. Uh, interesting idea. Yeah. Um, that sort of creates an, a new IPA problem, right? It's like, it does, it's not really going to solve too much. Um, could be useful. Um, the beginner level, you don't have to necessarily be a complete beginner, but if, if you're sort of new to intonation, maybe, because that's that's really the, the best use of the IPA for language learning is to see approximately what sounds are shared between the languages you know and the new language, um, and then to be able to like train your ears and mouth for those new sounds, adjust slightly into the sounds that aren't exactly the same, um, and whatnot. But then after that, the IPA is pretty much useless in language learning. Um, because if you can already hear the sounds and if you can already produce the sounds, why do you need a visual, you know, like a visual symbol? Because we're talking about spoken sounds, right? Um, the only use of the IPA after that would be to show somebody else, oh, it's this particular sound. But ideally, right, if they're past the beginner level, they should have already, again, trained their ears, trained their, uh, their, um, mouth, at least the ears of nothing else, in which case the symbol becomes pointless again. So um, the IPA is really only useful as an initial tool in language learning. In linguistics, it has a much bigger role that can be very, very useful. But in language learning, it's very limited um, and should only be used as the limited tool that it is. 
not as a something that you rely on. Um, so anyway, that aside, um, you, you kind of just be recreating the same problem, but for intonation instead of sounds, right? Um, interesting idea, though. It is an interesting idea. And uh, banking on the idea of picking up through immersion, at the end of the day, you, you can't beat sheer input, right? Because you can go, whether it's grammar, vocabulary, um, or certain aspects of pronunciation like intonation, the sounds you have to directly train. You, you, you just have to. Maybe there's some weird cases where somebody's talented and they don't have to through a lot of uh, input, but the sounds need to be trained consciously um, if you're past a certain age. Um, but for the grammar, for the vocabulary, for higher levels like intonation and, and the stress and all that stuff, uh, there's no replacement for massive input, massive, massive input. Um, now, of course, you have to focus. On, you're not just going to absorb everything necessarily, not, not as an adult. The grammar uh, and to some extent the vocabulary can be more or less absorbed, but you still have to be paying attention. You have to notice things. Um, and you have to soak your brain in the language. So you know, I know there's a debate about that. Um, that is my perspective. But uh, when it comes to intonation, yes. Um, I, immersion would be ideal, but even if it's not immersion, just like massive input um, uh, in some form over time, that is going to get the, the rhythm, the music, into your your brain, like Japanese, for example. I was just thinking about this when I was watching an, uh, an episode of um, an anime the other day, because uh, it's anime season again, and I'm watching a couple animes. Uh, but uh, I was because I'm I'm researching intonation. My brain was kind of in that mode, and so I'm watching this anime, and I'm just like listening to the Japanese intonation. They're like, I can't even mimic it right now because it's not established well in my brain. But they have this very specific sort of rhythm and and way that they speak where we're like blah 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 and they're like da 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 and it's sort of it's broken up differently and it flows differently um and uh i don't know if there's any other languages that share that pattern like korean might because korean and japanese are kind of similar in their their grammar um at least but uh to me it sounds very japanese um it doesn't sound english at all uh so yeah, you have to get exposed to the language, um, the actual sound of the language, not the written language, not the visual language, the actual sound of the language. Um, you have to spend a lot of time with it. Okay. Uh, is there any grammatic rule about what to go for choosing, what to go, what to do uh, for choosing between er suffix and the word more added in front of it? Oh, okay. Got it. So this is a grammar question. Uh, is there any sort of grammatic rule? Probably, but English has lots of exceptions. <laughs> um, off the top of my head, I would say no. Uh, that's something that I'm I'm going to try to tackle at some point. Um, as I've, I've said a couple times in recent live streams, um, now that the main pronunciation course is kind of coming, like I'm kind of getting to the end of it, uh, and the mouth posture videos are sort of on hold as I continue to explore uh, phase two with people I'm working with and developing more techniques around it. Um, the I still will be making some pronunciation related videos, like always, but um, I'm going to be making you know more content on like grammar, on different areas, um, beginner stuff, uh, vocabulary building you know, all areas of English over time. This, this is going to be a full language channel, not just a pronunciation channel. Um, so eventually that's one of the topics that I kind of want to go in and see if there's a way to like hack it, like I did with the prepositions, um, like I'm trying to do with the verbs. So I might have a better answer in the future. Um, right now, input. <laughs> so there's lots of input. Um, Part of the problem is that some of these are, are changing. Um, so natives will make mistakes, or sometimes natives just make mistakes because they're thinking about one thing and then they change it. So um, like, for example, more easy. 
more easy, right? So it's uh, supposed to be easier, not more easy. And yet you will sometimes hear natives say more easy. Um, and that could be maybe they were going to say like more something else. Like, and they weren't sure of, of what word they were looking for. So they know that they wanted it to be more. It's like that, you know, bigger of whatever word they're going to say. So it's like more easy, right? And then they put the word easy. So it's like more and easy. So it, it didn't come out as easier because it wasn't formed in their mind yet. They just knew the more part was going to be there. And then they, they weren't sure about what the second word was going to be. Um, so things like that can happen. Um, or sometimes natives just make this mistake. Um, occasionally you'll even hear natives say more easier or just <laughs> double positive or, you know, double more, which is grammatically incorrect. Um, that's a, a mistake. Um, even natives will sometimes make that mistake. Uh, and then some things are changing. Um, like I think the, the pattern is that things want to become this ER ending more often. Um, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but there's some that, that use more uh, and they don't have the ER ending. But there's some words that are sort of in transition where if you say either one, they both sound fine. Um, and I think that's because the, um, remember in general, like in terms of like verb conjugations and um, certain other aspects, like saying there's with plural instead of there are, uh, English over the last 500 or so years, um, maybe longer than that, has been slowly sort of simplifying uh, various aspects of the grammar. Um, and so I think that's also part of that process where the, the, the more form is still very much there. There's, you know, many words where if you say the, the ER ending, it's not going to sound good. It's not going to sound right. But there's quite a few. Again, I can't think of any off the top of my head because I'm horrible on the spot. Um, but there's quite a few words that seem to be transitioning from more something to something or, um, and they both sound good. Uh, so unfortunately you're kind of in the middle of that. It would be nice if it would just, if it were just all ER and more didn't exist, uh, with adjectives that just make it nice and simple, but here we are. So. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a solid answer for you right now. Just pay attention to the language um, and yeah, <laughs> lots of input, lots of input. Um, there's a sentence intonation that was associated with questions, but that recently, past decade or so, has been used in declarative statements uh, as if the question element was only a confirmation tag. Some people will do a full speech using that and might be highly annoying intonation happens like that. Okay, so I think you're talking about up talk uh, or up speak, as Delio mentions. Um, perhaps I'm not familiar with the terminology. Yeah, so for example, right? So if if I'm explaining something to you and then I'm just kind of always going up at the end, like I'm never going to end what I'm saying and I just kind of want to keep dragging it on, that's pretty annoying. Yeah, it's called up talk, also called Valley Girl speak. Um, unfortunately, uh, in my research, I actually came across the uptalk. I'm going to briefly mention that in the intonation lesson. Uh, but there was somebody talking about the uptalk uh, problem. And uh, a couple of people, actually. Um, and I, I very much agree that it, it sounds annoying. Um, there's a particular YouTuber that I, I used to like to watch a lot. Um, cause I really like the, the type of content and stuff. Um, she's a, a vegan channel and I didn't notice it at first. Um, probably because I usually listen on two times speed, but for whatever reason, um, when I was just listening to her one day and I noticed that she has this, it's, it's sort of like a, a, a slight up talk pattern. It's not like super exaggerated, but it's like the slight, and as soon as my ears picked that up, I couldn't unhear it. And I, I, pretty much ended up stopping stop stopping watching her channel yes that's grammatically correct i ended up stopping watching her channel um not because i don't like her not because i don't like the content i really want to continue watching her channel sometimes i still will um but i i wasn't watching it as much as i was because that it's just like it it's it's annoying it stands out it's annoying so 
but the unfortunate thing is that it seems that uh, many young women and some, even to some extent, some young men uh, are actually starting to pick this up as a standard pattern. Um, in fact, you'll probably kind of notice it a little bit with me here and there sometimes. I notice I can sometimes do a little bit of up talk, but um, it, it, it's as long as it's not every single phrase that you say, then it's not really that big of a deal. Um, but you also have to don't, don't confuse it with normal rising um, because that lets the listener know that there's more information. Um, so I guess I don't confuse that with normal rising. See, that's not necessarily up talk. I could go up or I could go down. I could say, don't confuse that with normal rising, period. Like that's the end of my statement. And then I could add if I want, like maybe, oh yeah, okay. I want to say because blah, blah, blah. Or I could say, don't confuse it with normal rising because, okay. So, uh, and I may or may not have a pause there. So just because we go up like that doesn't mean it's up talk. It's this usual like consistent, like every phrase more or less going up like that. That is more the up talk. Uh, even usually at the end of regular statements, uh, they still might go up. So yeah, um, it is annoying. Don't do it. <laughs> Uh, okay. Do you know what a family locker room is? I know locker rooms. I've never heard of that before. I have no idea. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, Mr. Holmes. Welcome, Mr. Holmes. Uh, it's been two years of me learning English. Is this sentence correct? It's been two years of me learning English. My initial impression is yes. Um, my second impression is maybe. <laughs> uh, there's some things that, that will still sound really good, even though they're not grammatically correct. Um, it's been two years of me learning English. I would say that this is a perfectly fine sentence. Um, it does kind of sound... Let's see. It's been two years of me learning English. It's hard to describe. It's there's there's a little bit of of a, a feeling to it. Um, like instead of saying it's been two years since I started learning English, or I've been learning English for two years, th those would be like the standard ways to say that. Um, it's been two years of me learning English. It kind of sounds. Like it's attached to something else. It's not just like a statement in itself, but it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really hard to describe here. Um, to me, it sounds fine. It does. Um, yeah. Uh, nothing. Welcome. <laughs> Could you teach how to make American R? How should the tongue position be? Okay, good question. Um, and the short, simple, but not quick answer. Uh, the answer itself will be really, really quick here because I'm going to give you one uh, phrase, but the process is not quick. Mouth posture. That's how you get it. Um, I know some people might be like, here it goes again with the mouth posture. I promise I won't rant. Um, but <laughs> I, I have several, I have, I have like one or two shorts uh, giving tips about the R. Um, I have a whole lesson about the R sound um, and then some lessons on the R colored vowels. Um, I assume we're talking about like just the base R, whether a consonant or a vowel. Um, and the way that I describe it in that main lesson uh, is uh, accurate. It's fine. Um, it's very much based off of how it feels in my mouth. Um, we know that there's the retroflex R where the tip of the tongue can be pointed upward. Um, that's how many teachers teach it. It's not the only way to do it. Um, you can also have it be pointed straight, pointed down. It doesn't matter what the tip of the tongue does as long as it's not touching or not too close to touching anything. Um, that's completely irrelevant for the sound, the quality of the sound in English or in American English, at least. Um, 
it's made with the middle of the tongue is where the sound is placed. It's sort of above the, the uh sound. Um, and the back of the tongue has to, very broadly speaking, the back of the tongue has to be out of the way enough that there's still a lot of space here so the sound can flow through. Um, you're not trying to like push the back of your tongue in and down like that necessarily, but um, if it's like too tense and too high, like, and you start to cut off. Um, you also want to make sure the middle isn't too high because then you get there's not enough airflow. We always want the airflow. Um, so if you haven't seen that lesson, go watch that lesson. Um, the the R, R the er vowel sound um, also consonant produced the same way. Uh, however. Uh, that is good in itself, but at the end of the day, um, the more that I ex that I explore this mouth posture concept, the more that I work with people, um, especially in phase two where we're working on all the sounds um, and building them into the mouth posture, the more that I'm convinced that the, I don't want to say the only way, but the, the, the relatively easiest, quickest, most efficient, best way to get any sound in any language that you have difficulty with, so in this case, the American R, is to start with the mouth posture of that language. Um, and I'm going to give you a very, very simple, useful, easy to understand example. This is my favorite go-to example. Um, in Spanish, I know it's Spanish, but just hold on a second. In Spanish, Spanish, uh, like many languages apparently, has a slightly pushed forward tongue posture. So there's a little bit of tension here in the back, just a little bit that pushes the tongue slightly forward. The mouth is slightly more closed. For some reason, some people say it's more open. I think that's a lot of British people might say that because British English is more closed than American English. But compared to American English, Spanish has a more closed jaw. It's not a whole lot, it's a little more closed. Um, and the tongue is also held a little bit higher in the mouth. Now, in Spanish, the Spanish R what's written with the letter R, but it's a completely different sound. Um, there's a single tap and then there's a trill, right? Where you multiple tap. The single tap is very similar to the American flap D. We don't care about that so much, but the multiple one, okay. Why is mouth posture important? If you are an English speaker, such as myself, uh, an American English speaker specifically, we have a more open jaw position. We have our center of gravity, where the mouth posture is sort of centered around here. Okay, it could be a little bit back, but it's generally in the center. That's where our uh is. Right, nice, good, clear schwa sound. Uh, uh. Okay, Spanish, in addition to being more close, slightly pushed forward, the center of gravity is up here in e. Eh. Okay, so Spanish is very much largely spoken from from the, the tip of the tongue in in many ways. Um, it even affects how the O sounds, how the U sounds. Um, and if your mouth position is more like your jaw is more closed, your tongue is a little higher, your tongue is slightly pushed forward, and you need to tap here, it's a lot easier. But this is one of the hardest sounds in Spanish for English speakers to get, especially American English speakers, um, because not because the, the sound itself is so foreign. I mean, we have our flap D, which is a very similar sound. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. So you should think we should be able to just do that multiple times. Well, hitting it once is fine because we can drop back down into our posture. But because our mouth is relatively so much more open than Spanish, and because our center of gravity is here instead of up here, in order for us to try to tap, it's one of the most difficult things for us to, to do, just to be able to produce the sound. When I was teaching myself Spanish, not knowing anything, right? And, uh, luckily for me, I have a little bit of talent for language learning, and um, I managed to navigate a lot of things pretty well. Um, but even with the bit of talent that I, I apparently have, it took me six months not knowing anything about mouth posture. Mouth posture is a, a relatively new concept to me. Um, so I didn't know anything about pronunciation. I didn't know anything about language learning. I was just kind of trying to teach myself and go and, and explore things. And I like the sounds and, you know, I have sort of a natural um, affinity or right? I like playing with sounds and stuff. Um, and so even with that, it took me six months of daily practice just to start to do this with my tongue, just to start to roll my R in Spanish. Still to this day, 
because I'm using the wrong posture, it's still really hard for me to do and it's very inconsistent. But when I'm singing in Spanish, because I haven't gotten the Spanish posture in my speech yet, I haven't practiced it, but I've practiced it quite a bit in singing. And if I get that posture just right while I'm singing along, not only do my sounds seem just a little bit more native, a little bit crisper, a little bit clearer for Spanish, but that tri tapped, the trilled R happens effortlessly. I don't even have to try. So much so that even sometimes when it's supposed to be a single R, it'll do multiple. It just wants to happen. Um, that is the power and beauty of mouth posture. And it only makes sense if your mouth is not in the right posture, if you're not holding your mouth the right way, certain sounds and certain languages that have different mouth posture are going to be next to impossible for you to do, okay? Let alone master. <laughs> um, so my biggest tip to you, nothing, would be learn the mouth posture of American English. Um, I am still developing that course. I am still exploring and building out techniques around it. It's coming along very, very well. Um, but I will not be posting more lessons about that until I work with uh, some more people to solidify phase two, which is all the consonants and all the vowels. Um, but you can look at uh, what I have so far um, in case you haven't seen it. which would be, um, there's sort of a, it, it, the introduction video is a little long, it's like a half hour, but it lays out the basic concept, basic idea, why, what mouth posture is, why it's important. Um, and that's the start of a playlist that I have for this mini course. Where is it? Uh, mouth posture, there it is. Okay. Um, so that will take you to a playlist. Um, the first video is sort of this introduction, explanation, what is mouth posture? What is the center of gravity? Blah, blah, blah. Um, then there's mouth posture phase zero, which is just getting control over your vocal tract. It doesn't really have anything to do with American English directly, but everybody that I've worked with that has gotten to phase two, which is building out all the sounds into the mouth posture, every single person, even if at first they were very skeptical or they didn't like the phase zero process, it seemed too boring, too simple, too basic, every single person, I made them pass certain checkpoints in phase zero. Once they got to phase two, they looked back and they were like, oh, phase zero was the single most important work I ever did in my pronunciation. Some of these people have been trying to improve their pronunciation for a year, two years, five years, maybe even 10 years. And phase zero was the most important material that they ever worked through. Um, so do not underestimate phase zero. It seems like it's too simple. It seems like it's too basic, but if you can't pass the checkpoints, like being able to get your tongue to go up, the back of your tongue by itself to go up, for example, um, clearly without going up and back, right? Nice, good control. If you can't do pass those checkpoints for the throat and the tongue, you're not ready to try to take on the, the sounds in a new language. You need to get basic control of your vocal tract. And this applies to, to any language you want to learn, not just American English. Then mouth posture phase one, which I also have the lesson for, that starts to get your jaw a little more open if it needs to be open because it seems many languages are more closed than american english even british english is a little more closed than american english um, but not all languages will have the jaw be more closed so you have to determine that based on your native language um, but if, if your mouth if your jaw is more closed it will help you practice getting that jaw more open and it'll help you get the center of gravity in american english which is a uh, Okay, like a nice, clear, fully enunciated schwa sound um, that everything in the language, all the sounds are sort of affected by and revolve around, including the er. And if you can get a good uh, getting the er is relatively simple. You still will probably have some difficulty, but um, there was one person that I'm working with right now and they had difficulty with the er. It was like, okay, yeah, kind of sounds like an English er, but it's it's not quite right. After going through phase zero and phase one, and then just doing a little bit of work with them uh, to, to describe how to make the R, they got it. And they have it. They haven't lost it. It's been like a month and they, they still have it. Um, so it's so much easier once your mouth is in place, right? Once you're holding your mouth the right way. Um, so that's my biggest tip. Anyway. I know I said I wasn't going to rant, but there you go. <laughs> um, 
Like mouth posture is a game changer. Um, in fact, if uh, if any random person learning any language, if they were to come up to me and be like, hey, I want to improve, or I, I want to learn this language, or I want to improve this language, maybe you're already you know, intermediate or something. I want, I want to improve, or I want to start learning a language. What is the number one best thing that you recommend that I do? Um, and it depends a little bit on the goals, but especially if they want to sound um, at least really good in the language, or at least just very clearly understood. Um, you don't have to do mouth posture if you just want to be understood. Uh, but if they're, especially for pronunciation, if they're like, what's the one thing that I should do? Like, if you could just give me one thing to do, I would say go do phase zero. Once you pass those checkpoints, you will be ready to start trying to get the sounds of a new language. Um, even if you don't do the actual rest of the mouth posture, phase zero is, is going to give you, um, phase zero will give you the ability to get like 99% which is what my Spanish is more or less. It's about 98, 99% from pronunciation, but it's a little bit off. It's just a little bit off um, because I didn't have, I never had the mouth posture um, and the rhythm, which I didn't know about when I was teaching myself. Um, but anyway, uh, do you know what a leading question is? I Googled it, but didn't understand it. Uh, leading question, uh, I assume a question that is intended to lead someone somewhere, um, not physically, but in the flow of conversation. Um, so, like, you're trying to get them to say something or, or to start talking about a particular topic uh, without specifically sort of uh, saying that that's true or whatever. Like, it's so the, I think that might come from a legal context. I'm not sure. Um, like, objection, leading. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I don't know. Um, it's a little bit of a specific vocabulary. Um, I, I don't, I'm not particularly familiar with it myself. Uh, Anderson is here. Okay. So those words have in common a consonant followed by the schwa sound and ending in ry. Is there a rule for that? Unfortunately, I could find only one word that doesn't end with tree. Okay, so we have library, military, adultery, laboratory, uh, elementary. We forgot to write the word elementary. Um, okay, so now you you transcribe these as library, military, uh, adultery, laboratory, and elementary. That is that's not the full uh, standard pronunciation. Um, the way that I have them is the full way. So library, military, adultery. Notice I'm using different sounds for that, that middle syllable there. Laboratory, um, elementary. Okay. But... Um, the library one is, is a little bit interesting. Um, if you say library in clearly enunciated speech, like I'm going to the library, it's probably going to sound weird and maybe a little uneducated. Um, but if you're speaking quickly, I'm going to go to the library, library, library. It sounds perfectly fine. As I said, it's, it's more of a reduction for the other ones that have that T. This is actually a normal thing. Um, it's actually the same reason why, uh, like I was talking to, um, horrible with names, Brandon, I was talking to Brandon in the comments, uh, of another, uh, of a video about why dream becomes dream. Also why train can be pronounced train. Um, it's actually a very similar thing that's happening here. Um, so. The first thing we need to understand, if you have TR and it's an R consonant, you can pronounce it as a T, you can pronounce it as a CH. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, some people will by default pronounce it as a T, which is how it traditionally is. Some people such as myself, um, and I don't just mean some, like I think it's maybe about like half the population. I don't know exact numbers, but quite a few people, including myself, um, 
blend the T into a CH before the R and blend the D into a J before the R um, because it's a little easier to speak. Um, I think this was initially sort of like a, a lazier type of way to speak, um, like way back, say 100 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe, I don't know. Um, but now it's this just the standard way that many people pronounce it. Um, and saying like train just seems a little more enunciated, uh, like to my ears. Um, so either way is fine. It does not matter at all. Uh, in fact, I'll use both. You'll hear me use both. Um, I tend to use ch instead of t before the consonant r, um, but I will use both. Now, uh, if you have t plus the er vowel, okay, the default thing to do is that you cannot change the t into a ch. So, for example, there's the word train, and there's the word terrain. Now, if I change that T in the second one into terrain, it just sounds like I'm saying train with a really long uh, er sound, because the er vowel is slightly longer than the consonant. Um, and it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. Uh, but if you have T and you have the er vowel, and it's be it's it's uh, I guess you could say it's being re reduced right to where I actually have a lesson on this specific reduction. Um, see if I can find it in a second. But um, notice that what we're doing here is we're actually deleting in terrain. We're not we have two syllables and we're we're not trying to reduce it all into one syllable like the word train. That's just one syllable. Terrain needs two syllables. But in these words like military, adultery, laboratory, elementary that syllable can be reduced. And what we do is we, instead of saying ter, we basically shorten the length of the er vowel to make it into the er consonant, because that's the only difference between the two. Um, and then we, ch we blend the T into the CH. Um, and so that what was a syllable ter now just becomes a sound combination at the start of the next syllable, so tree. Okay, um, and that allows us to eat one of those syllables. Um, let me see here. Okay, uh, I want to go content. Was it in the lesson I talked about chocolate? I don't know. Um, er reductions. Nope, no hits. Um, I can't remember what I called the lesson. Um, Reduction. Nope, that's not it. Er, I didn't even find my own lesson. <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, so I, I mean, I could spend a minute looking for it here. I don't want to waste the time doing that, but um, I wonder if I put, um, I go to YouTube. I type in English hacks chocolate because I'm pretty sure the thumbnail said chocolate because I was talking about like um, instead of saying chocolate, you can say chocolate. Um, yeah, that's not bringing up any results. That's just a bunch of chocolate stuff. So uh, I don't know. I'll have to try to find that lesson later or something. Point is, is that that that's a thing that happens. So there you go. Um, but again, library is, is sort of the uh, special one there that, again, you, if you enunciate that, it's going to probably sound a little uneducated. It's going to sound weird. Um, that one is, is purely a reduction in the flow of speech. Where the other ones, it, it doesn't matter. I could say uh, he's in the military or it's very elementary. Um, he's working in the laboratory. It's okay. Um, though by default, if you tend to slow down, if you tend to enunciate, we are more likely to unreduce that and actually say laboratory, elementary. So it doesn't really matter which one you say. Because um, remember, it's part of the range, the dynamic range. Um, but with the exception of library, this particular combination uh, 
can be used regardless of speed. It's just the slower we go, the more enunciate we go, the, the more likely we are to use the original pronunciation. Um, okay, anyway, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, what's, <laughs> okay, so you put thy, though, <laughs> So you spelled though, it's supposed to be thou, um, which would be spelled T-H-O-U, uh, thy, thou, and thee. This is from, uh, I don't know, it probably existed in Middle English, um, but you'll see this in like the works of Shakespeare. Shakespeare spoke early modern English. So it's still technically like right now I'm speaking modern English. You guys are learning modern English. Um, Shakespeare which was what, like four or 500 years ago, something like that, um, spoke early modern English and how much the language has changed, right? We haven't even separated it out into a different type of English yet. There's old English, which was very different than how I speak now. Middle English, which was quite a bit different than how I speak now. Um, and then early modern English, which you find in Shakespeare. Um, thy, thou, and thee used to be the words for you. Um, and if I remember right, because English, uh, just like Spanish and Portuguese and French and German, there used to be a formal you and an informal you. The word you that we currently use was one of those. And then the word uh, the, is it the, uh, thou, I think it was thou was the subject, um, like you do, thou doest, um, or thou doth, whatever, how, whatever the conjugation was. Um, thou was, uh, the other form. I think if I remember right, the, thou, the, so thou, thy, thee, and thine, like mine, right? Thine, instead of yours, it used to be thine. Um, I think that that, uh, was for the informal you. It might've been for the formal you. I don't remember. Um, you can look it up, but one was informal, one was formal. So there's thou and you. Now we just say you, right? This That's another example of the simplification that English has gone through that I was talking about and continues to go through. Um, so basically you can ignore it. You can completely ignore it. Just know that if you see one of those words, because most modern English speakers, we don't even know like which is which. <laughs> um, it's just like, it's it's this sort of really old sounding language. Uh, and uh, if if for whatever reason you encounter it, just know that it's 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 supposed to make that uh that person sound like they're from a, a completely different time like from shakespeare's time um so like if if uh maybe you're watching doctor who and shakespeare gets in the tardis and comes to modern day reality and you know he says oh you know uh i don't know thou hast brought in me to the present or something. I don't know, like you've brought me to the present, whatever. So, okay. Uh, and so when you talk about salary, the standard is say it per month or per year. Uh, Cause I once heard the sentence, what's the starting salary of the job offer? 75,000 hotel business. So maybe it's a luxury one that she's going to work at. Um, Salaries, um, I'm not sure because I've never had a salary myself. <laughs> um, all the jobs that I've had where I actually worked for somebody else, which I haven't done in years, thankfully for me. Um, but all the jobs that I had where I was working for somebody else uh, was the salary. It was just like a regular, like every two weeks paycheck. Um, but I'm pretty sure salaries go, uh, you could probably, it depends on the contract. Like, I mean, you probably have a monthly salary, a yearly salary, but I think the, uh, the standard is yearly. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm just, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that, uh, stuff. So, um, but yeah, if it's 75,000, <laughs> They're not making 70. I can almost guarantee like there's probably maybe like some fancy hotel in Dubai or something would pay their workers 75,000 a month. Like, but that that's just is ridiculous. Like if if you have a, a high level position, maybe in a really, really, really fancy, really you know crazy hotel, but that's pretty much guaranteed. 
that's yearly, seventy five thousand a year, yeah, um, which is decent. It's not even like crazy a lot for a yearly amount. Um, what's the difference in pronunciation of the words gun and gone? Exactly that, gun and gone. Uh, gone uses ah, which in the way I speak is a lot simpler because it uses the cot cot merger, so ah. Um, probably the confusion comes because there are still quite a few speakers that don't have the cot cot merger. It's something that is sort of taking over across the country. It has been taking over over the last several decades. Um, but there's still a lot of people who don't have the cot cot merger. So they say ah, like ah and all. Ah. Um, if they don't have the merger, I'm pretty sure gone, G O N E, is pronounced with that unmerged ah. And then gun um, uses the upside down V sound, which is part of the range of the schwa um, with, in the way that I teach it. Uh, and the upside down V and the unmerged ah are very close in sound, which causes a big problem for, for English learners. Um, but that also, right, the way I teach you is uh, if you use the merger, that ah sound now, not the upside down V, but the unmerged ah moves back here. Um, and your ears will actually adapt to it. And you don't even have to like train your ears to hear the difference. People who use the who don't use the merger, you'll start to be able to, to identify gone as the merged sound, even if they're not uh, pronouncing it that way. Um, not foolproof, but that's generally how it works. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's two different sounds. Um, what's the difference in pronunciation of the words duck and dock? Same, same difference, same exact difference. Um, are you familiar with the following words or expressions? Stingy, yes. Knackered, never heard it. Yank them out and... Uh, okay, so, I mean, yank, yeah, that's a normal word bloody good bloke that definitely sounds very british <laughs> um I, we're familiar enough bloke is, is a common enough word in british english that we get exposed to it we understand more or less what it means um like guy dude whatever um uh it comes from uh, english british british english um video test could you correct the order of the words in parentheses, not sure if I did it right. Yeah, British English. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the only ones, uh, we don't use bloke in American English. We also don't use bloody with that meaning. Um, it's actually, it's like a curse word in British English. Um, we tend to prefer the F word <laughs> instead. Uh, although in this case, we'd probably say like, like he's a damn good guy. Um, so aside from the fact that we don't really use bloke, but we will understand it, um, knackered is the only one. I have no idea what that means. Um, all the other ones are just normal words. Yeah. Um, okay. Finn, welcome Finn. Okay. I'm not too far behind. Um, my friend who's Peruvian. He sounds American when he speaks English, has been speaking it since he was a tween. A tween yeah. um, it's such an awkward word, <laughs> probably because it's such an awkward age, but uh, drops the K when he says like that in fast, normal speech. Does that sound off to you? Okay, he drops the K. Something like that. That's perfectly normal. Yeah. Um, I could offer a potential explanation for that. I don't think it, it really matters. Uh, it'd ultimately be rooted in shifting in a strange way. Uh, where we're sort of like, but anyway, uh, if you say, it's like that, it's like that, it's like that, 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 like that. Um, I would add I have a caveat here. So in really fast speech, it kind of doesn't matter. You could just drop the K, whatever. Nobody cares. <laughs> um, if it's 
not super fast. It's like maybe on the faster end of normal or on the lower end of super fast. You know, it's sort of a, a line there. Um, but if it's within normal speech going into faster, um, it's quite likely that one of two things is going to happen instead of just straight dropping the K. Um, either A, we will straight drop the K, but only when we use the dental D. Um, uh, and in this particular combination, right? So that is supposed to be dental D if we say that, right? Um, and so that's why I say it's it's it could be kind of like a shifting where normally we actually, we shift from T, D, or N into P, B, M, or K, G, M. In this case, we're kind of like shifting from K into dental D, which is weird. That's not like necessarily a standard thing, but it, it, it should make sense how it kind of functions in a similar way. And that's could explain why that happens. Um, the other thing that might happen is instead of completely dropping the K and going into a dental D, um, you could still do a dental D either way. It doesn't matter. But especially if you just do like like a the, like you say, like uh, like that, like that, like that. If you just say lie with no K at all and then go into a full TH, it's probably going to sound weird um, if you're not speaking really, really fast. But if you do that sort of half K, like we talked about with, say, like asks, right? So instead of, that, well, it's technically the SKS. It doesn't have to be SKS. But that's a good example where the S is here, S, and then instead of going S, right we do so we sort of move towards it maybe get like almost kind of into that k um possibly but it doesn't ever actually close and create a full k sound um so if you say like like okay that's what's coming out there it's not i'm not closing and saying k. it's just like like and i'm not trying to produce a h sound i'm just saying like if you slow it down that's what would be being produced because it's just that closed like that, like that, like that, like that. So there might be this sort of a little bit of motion in the back, and then we bring up into the TH. So there's some variation of exactly what can happen between the two. Um, but a straight dropping of the K, I would say you, you most likely you would either need a dental D there, or you have to be speaking really, really fast. Um, but generally, yeah, it's, it's, it's a perfectly fine thing that can happen. Um, Fernando uh, is the Spanish the I think that's the, 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 I know that one and the other one, I know they're the TH symbols, but I always mix them up. Uh, I'm going to assume it's the because Spanish doesn't have the voiced one, <laughs> uh, as in the though. That is not the sound. Um, no, 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 no. Okay. So let me double check, see what the IPA says. So let's see what kind of nonsense is going on here. Um, okay, so they do list it as that. That's interesting. Um, what about? Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Then what would be? Wait, what? Oh, okay, I guess, yeah, that, that provides a slightly different framework that makes sense in my brain. Okay, so uh, what I have always been aware of is that, and any Spanish speaker would be aware of, uh, in Castilian Spanish, right, from Spain, and not all speakers, speakers in the South, they, um, they're the ones that gave the accent uh, to Latin America because most of the conquistadores were from southern Spain, but a lot of Spain... Um, the, they have a TH sound, a voiceless TH, like we say in thing, right? And that would be like when they say um, corazón, right? Corazón. People in Latin America generally don't do that. Um, it's replaced with an S sound. So I was already aware of that. Um, that's the voiceless TH. And then what I was always thinking is like, okay, there is no voice to TH in, um, in Spanish, but this actually kind of it's a different way to look at it. It makes sense to me. But this is another reason why I would say don't do do not uh, pay attention to the IPA. Um, again, as a starting reference, see, this is maybe a good case as a starting reference. If you go, so right now I'm on I'm on Wikipedia. 
I'm on the um, help IPA Spanish page, which I can go ahead and post this if you want to take a look at what I'm looking at. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, you see consonants, right? It says IPA examples, English approximation. Okay. And you go down the sounds a little bit. Um, so it lists a D, right? You'll see like what looks like a D for the IPA. And then it gives the examples, uh, the first D in, in dedo, let's say that in an English way, quando and aldaba. I'm just going to go ahead and say it in an English way, which would correspond to the English today, the English D sound. Okay. Then below that, it shows this symbol that Fernando wrote, um, which in English is the IPA symbol that we use to represent the voiced TH. Th, okay. Not the dental D, the voiced TH. Th, okay. Um, but according to this page, it's saying that that symbol also represents the Spanish sound, like the D, the second D in da diva, arder, admirar, uh, atmosfera, I guess, well, maybe, uh, and juventud, okay? Thank you, Fernando, because you just gave me, I need to, hopefully I'll remember to cut this part of the video out later and make it its own little separate video. Um, you just provided me with a perfect example of how and why you, I don't wanna say should, but can, definitely can use the IPA as an initial reference, but to go beyond it, okay? Why? The Spanish D in general, now there's a bit of variation Right? There's there's different dialects in this net, but in general, the Spanish D is it's a dental D. Okay. Now maybe as a Spanish speaker, you might tell me that maybe the first D in in dedo is more of a D, right? Where you're actually farther back, you're not touching the teeth. If that's the case, okay. That's not what I learned. That's not how I pronounce it. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not the native speaker. Uh, but we do know that there's definitely a D sound, what is written as a D in Spanish, that is pronounced on the teeth, right? It's flatter. I pronounce all Ds in Spanish that way. I would say dedo, cuando, aldaba, okay? I would say um, dadiba, arder, admirar, at, ad, well, I would say atmos, atmos. This may not be right, but I'm doing a little dental T there. And juventud, juventud. The, if I were to push it out, juventud. Okay, um, I treat all those Ds the same. Maybe I'm wrong there, I'm not the native speaker. However, that's not the point. The point here that I wanna make about the IPA is that this symbol, the sort of circle with the little thingy and then a little line through the top thingy, okay? This is not, in Spanish and English, this is not the same sound as the voice to TH, okay? It's not the same sound as the voice to TH. Now, if I use, if I replace the full official correct the TH sound, voice to TH sound in English, if I replace it with the dental D alternative, which is a different sound, but in American English, we use it as a, a different way to, uh, like a replacement for the TH sound. It's not a TH sound, it's a replacement. We're using a different sound in place of the TH sound. That would be the, the, which is the Spanish D. At the very least, this Spanish D that we're talking about that has the symbol, if nothing else. So the fact that this page right here is saying, maybe the page is wrong, I don't know, but the, this page right here is saying that according to the IPA, the Spanish D in arder, and this, the TH sound, the, this, and the word this in English is the same, and they are absolutely 100% not. If that were true, either A, American English and British English, all English, would say this and never this. The, the sound the would not exist in English. It would only be the, pure dental D. Or the Spanish D, at least in these words, would be pronounced like this. Dadiva, arder, admirar, atmosfera, 
Juventud. And maybe there's some Spanish speakers that kind of speak like that, but I'm pretty sure you guys don't speak that way. Why is my screen going down? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure you don't do that. Okay. Uh, are they similar? Yeah. The and the are kind of similar. That's actually part of the reason why in American English we can use the as a replacement for the. Um, and we don't even notice that we do it. Are they the same? No. If you are a Spanish speaker, and you say the word this, it happens to work out for you because we do use that sound, the, the. We do use it as a replacement for the voice TH. So you're fine. But let's say me, as an English speaker, if I were to use this as a reference and I start trying to teach myself Spanish and I start saying dadiva, are maybe I get everything else right. Are there, admirar, atmosfera. Eh, eh, it's not right. Okay. So, um, however, I will say, I have noticed in Spanish, right? I think all languages for sounds in general, consonants, vowels, maybe not every single sound, but I, I do notice, right? People aren't perfect. People aren't machines. Um, and especially when we speak faster, we kind of get a little lazy with things, right? Um, regardless of what language it is, regardless of the, the rhythm of the language, it seems to be something that kind of happens. Um, and maybe it happens more in American English. Maybe we have more of a dynamic range and things that can happen. But um, I have noticed for sure, my ears tell me that this is definitely true, um, I've noticed many cases where the Spanish D, even if it's at the, the, the start of a syllable, like where the IPA says it's a D sound, like in today, which that sound does not exist in Spanish. This, uh, this has to be wrong. It absolutely has to be wrong. Um, maybe for some Spanish speakers, but based on the Spanish that I've heard, no, that you guys never use the English D. Um, regardless of that, point is, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> yeah, I've heard many, many cases uh, where regardless of, of which D it is. Um, to me, it always sounds dental, but you can get really lazy with it where it does get actually much closer to an actual TH sound, a voice TH sound in English. So, um, and I'm thinking, I can't think of the name of the song. I know it's uh, Jesse and Joy is the artist. Um, I can't think of the exact song, I don't remember, but um, I think she does it actually quite a lot uh, in, in, in her songs. Um, but where instead of saying like, like for example, uh, uh, I'm sure I think what another word. Okay, but instead of like dedo, right? It'll be like like de dedo dedo dedo. Like it can be that way, but it's lazy, right? Instead of dedo dedo do 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 do. Um, and so I've noticed that you can sort of do like fully enunciated or like a little lazy to where it's more like a the, but I don't think you ever fully do like a, the. like you never say like dead though or, or dead though or something like that. Um, that would just be too much. It's not quite correct in Spanish. Um, so to your original question, is the Spanish uh, the as in that the same as in the English, the, like in that? No, might be very similar, but it's not the same. Not the same. Um, okay, now I'm behind. Nothing. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm very curious to know. Keep in mind, guys. I got. I can go maybe a little bit longer today, but um, 1:30 is my cutoff. It's 1:08, so we got about 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm very curious to know what Fernando just asked. Feels weird not seeing myself. <laughs> um, now that I popped the chat out, I actually don't have to have this open and. Um, I want to make sure the stream is still going. Okay, so uh, I'm very curious to know what Fernando just asked, because many Americans that teach Spanish teach to do their D like that. Uh, they don't say it's exactly the same sound. They give examples where it's very similar, like brother. Uh, and I think they might be teaching what you call dental D. They don't use that term, though, to the Spanish D like teach sound. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what other people teach and how they're teaching Spanish and whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you 
you was formal. Oh, okay. There you go. See, he knows better than me. <laughs> I'm just a native. <laughs> I don't know any better. Uh, that was informal. According to IIRIC, uh, it looks like maybe you looked it up. Uh, David Crystal, thou would have vanished from English language if not for the KJ trans. Oh, yeah, the King James. Yeah, I think I heard something about that before. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know, KJ is King James Version. Um, where the Bible was translated into English from Latin. I think that was the original one. I don't remember. But it, it's it's an uh, English version of the Bible that um, was created when thou was still used. Um, and so if, if you read the English version of the Bible, the King James Version, it's KJ or KJB, King James Version, um, you can probably look it up online. You'll actually see how the language was back then. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's a little different. Um, but yeah, that, that, that version of the Bible still exists. Um, it's considered sort of like, a, like a standard sort of original English version version. Um, even though now we have like sort of more modern language versions and stuff, but some people don't trust, you know, the, that, and they like to go to the original English version. So, uh, yeah, that's probably the only reason why it exists. Um, I think Shakespeare also, because, I mean, we still have Shakespeare. Um, and Shakespeare used thou, thee, thy, whatever. Um, so I don't think it's all KJV, but whatever. Uh, why do British people speak better Spanish than Americans, even without trying that hard? Honestly, I don't know any American who speaks perfect Spanish. They all have the accent that gives them away. Do Spanish and British English have a similar mouth posture? Maybe that's it. Yes, that's actually actually exactly what I was going to say. Now, I don't speak British English. I haven't studied the exact mouth posture of British English. Um, I did a little bit of my, when I was exploring the idea of mouth posture, I found some information that indicates to me that British mouth posture is much closer to Spanish mouth posture than American English. And the more that I work with people, not in every case, but in almost every case, um, I've worked with Russians, Ukrainians, uh, a German speaker, um, a little bit with Spanish, some Mandarin. Um, I'm now working with a Cantonese speaker, a uh, French speaker. So uh, I have a little bit of a range, right? Mostly Western-based languages, but a little bit of a range there. And it, so far, it seems to me that everybody except the German um, has a more closed mouth posture. German does have a more closed throat. Um, at least he's an Austrian German speaker. This might be slightly different than um, standard German, but it's going to be very similar either way. Um, but even though the uh, the jaw is a little bit more open, closer to American English uh, in Austrian German or German in general, um, they still do have the tongue slightly pushed forward, and that's why the the throat is slightly more more uh, closed and tighter because everything shifts up when you push that tongue slightly forward. Uh, British English has the tongue slightly pushed forward. They kind of tend to speak farther from up here. There's the schwa sound that they have, especially when it replaces the er at the end, like wata, wata. Um, it's slightly slanted forward. It's more closed, um, which is why if I try to speak British English with American posture, um, somebody who isn't, like somebody who's an American or somebody who maybe, you know, is a non-native speaker of English, they might be very impressed. Like, wow, you sound British. But if I speak to an actual Brit, <laughs> it's very likely that if I use my American posture, they're going to be able to tell that something's not right. Um, like, I can even hear it myself. I'm not a master of it because I haven't, as I said, I, I, I don't care too much about the British posture. But um, just trying to shift it into more of like a Spanish type of posture um, and what I imagine the British posture to be, uh, it makes me sound more British if I do receive pronunciation. Um, so just using the word water, water, for example, if I say water, uh, 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 that's the center of gravity in English, water, water. Uh, uh, uh. But if you listen closely to British English, they don't say water. They say like water, water. Uh, uh, uh. It's, and again, I'm not a master of that. Don't quote me on that. But it, to me, it sounds a little more closed. It sounds maybe a little slanted forward, kind of like the Russian schwa. Um, so American English in many ways seems to be the oddball where we have our mouth more open than many other languages and dialects, we tend to have um, our center of gravity be, uh, well, we, we tend to have our tongue not pushed forward. <laughs> um, now, Scottish English, Cockney British English, not received pronunciation, but Cockney, um, 
they seem to be a bit farther back here. Australian, I'm not 100% sure, but I think they're also maybe a little centered to farther back um, as well. Um, and that helps contribute a lot to the, the sounds of those particular dialects. Um, so yeah, similar mouth posture, I would say. Um, also the fact that uh, English used to have a rolled R. I don't know exactly when it did or when it kind of disappeared, but there are some English speakers, British English speakers still to this day, they speak a particular dialect where they still, maybe not all the time, but sometimes when they say an R sound, it'll roll. Um, so, uh, and I can't think of a big example, but there, there's a, a YouTube channel, um, The I think it's called The Bioneer or something. Um, I kind of like that guy, he's a little bit weird, but... <laughs> um, definitely has some really interesting ideas. Yeah, the Bioneer. Um, this guy, he has this uh, this particular British accent where it, it generally, uh, like it sounds like like British, right? It's more or less uh, maybe received pronunciation. I'm not sure, but um, you'll sometimes hear him like he'll roll his R's a bit. Um, so whatever. Uh, probably another reason. So the, I think the British posture is already more in position to roll the R's. And so that's probably another reason why they speak better because again, the American mouth is too open to speak Spanish. <laughs> it's too open. Um, we can't, we, we can't get our mouth to, to do the sounds properly because we have too much space. Um, you eliminate that space and you start sounding uh, a lot more native. Um, I, I experimented with that with my old Spanish partner a couple weeks ago. And uh, again, I haven't mastered it in speech. I could do a lot better in speaking, but just the the little changes I was trying to make, they're like, yeah, you sound like so much better. Um, they say the way that I normally speak Spanish, they wouldn't be able to tell where I'm from, but I sound really, really good. It's just like something's a little bit off. And then when I tried to sort of change the posture a bit, they're like, yeah, that sounds perfect. So um, we just have our mouths to open, right? Like imagine, like, imagine if there were a language that held their mouth like this, right. and then now in American English, like my mouth is too closed, right? And I have to rah, 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 try to do that. Like, it's going to be weird. It's going to be awkward. I can't hit all the sounds if my mouth isn't open enough. So it's sort of the opposite problem. I can't hit the sounds right if my mouth is not closed enough in Spanish. Uh, okay. Blue. Hi, welcome blue. I uh, hope you're still here. Um, question, how to pronounce clearer, I like that clearer. So yeah, we have the do, two, do, I was gonna say double, and then that changed into two. Uh, we have the two R's. Um, first R is uh, an R colored E or I, it doesn't matter. You can say ear or ear. Um, it's completely interchangeable or anywhere in between that. Um, then the second R is just a regular er vowel sound. Um, so clear clearer you have to the end of ear slash ear right the end of that r colored diphthong uh, r colored vowel is the er position so you're already in that position after you say clear and then you have to you can't just hold it you can't say clear because vowels don't work that way in english you can't hold a vowel out um you hold a consonant out um like pass some, you can make the S longer, pass some, it's fine, but you can't hold a vowel out. Um, so you have to repeat the vowel, okay? And to do that, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can slightly get out of the position and then get back into the position, or you can hold the position and sort of like let your voice uh, drop down really quick and then push it back out. As long as there's a little bit of shift of some kind um, and then you get back into the sound, that's it. So clearer clearer, clearer, clearer. That's it. And then you just do that really quickly. And yeah. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Wendell here as usual. Welcome. Uh, R, make yourself at home and feel at home synonymous. Uh, I mean, basically, yes. <laughs> um, when you... Hmm. There's a little difference, and I'm having trouble articulating it. Make yourself at home to me. 
feels slightly more involved, right? Like if I just say feel at home, it's just like, oh, relax. You know, like you're fine, right? It's, it's like you're at home. So feel like you're at home. Where make yourself at home, it has that, but it can also imply like if I just, if I just say feel at home, which again, I mean, the, the, they could be used in, in the same context, but it's just a little shift of, of kind of what feels which way. Uh, let's say you come over to my house and I say, oh yeah, just feel at home. Okay. And you, and you, it, I point to the couch where I'm saying, just like, you know, sit on the couch, relax. Okay. Um, I could still say like, make yourself at home. It still works. But um, let's say the context is like, you're going to come and you're going to uh, visit me for a week, right? So you have like clothes, you have all this stuff. Okay. I could say feel at home. It still works. But now if I use make yourself at home, it sounds a little bit more like, okay, you know, unpack, you know, get your 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 room the way you want it so you're nice and comfortable, right? Just to me, it feels a little more involved than just like relax, right? But they're basically the same thing, you know. Um, you can use them pretty much interchangeably, I would say. Um, Wendell, also, what happened to the Z sound in three ways to understand the language? Do we have to make the devoicing when they connect Z sound to a consonant? No, uh, it's never required to do devoicing. Um, but remember, American English is a dynamic range and flow, which means that the slower and more clearly that you're speaking, the less we tend to link, the less we tend to um, reduce or change, which might happen with devoicing, for example, uh, certain sounds. Um, and then there's the flow of normal speech where a lot of these linking rules and, and changes, reductions happen. Um, and then in fast speech, we might get even more on top of that that starts to break some things um, that we wouldn't normally do in normal speech. Uh, So provided we're talking about sort of that normal range. Um, so three ways to understand. So after ways is a T. Okay. Now there's two ways that you can do this. Way, actually, there's three ways in this particular case because it's the preposition two, uh, which remember is very special in pronunciation. So you can say ways to, ways to. Okay, so that's a Z, maybe a little bit of an S at the end there as I drop the voice closing into the T, but it's there's clearly, it's a Z there. Ways to, okay, that's one way. That's a nice, good, clear, enunciated way. It could come out that way in the flow of normal speech, not a problem. Um, but if you're on that slower end, most likely that's the way it's going to come out because um, you're enunciating more. Uh, however, there, that's not the only way that things can happen because we do know that we have this partial end of word devoicing, which does not depend on the next sound. If the next sound is voiced, whether that's a vowel, which all vowels are voiced, or a consonant, a voice consonant, like if it were a D sound, um, it's more likely that we're not going to do the devoicing because why would we have voice and then devoice it just to go back into the voicing? doesn't really make much sense. Um, depends a bit on the flow and the rhythm of, of how you're speaking, but if they're going to be right next to each other, we're probably going to keep that voice all the way through. So it'd be like ways, and then say the next word is, um, I don't know, uh, dog, ways and dog. Okay, so ways dog, ways dog. We're probably not going to say ways dog, right? It's, maybe it could happen, but there's not really much point in it. Um, so uh, point here is that instead of doing a fully enunciated Z and then doing the T and two, the other version that you can do, especially because the next word is, vo or the next sound is voiceless, we can do that partial end of word devoicing. Remember, it's partially, you still have to start in the Z um, and say ways z right? So now we're already ready for that T. So basically we're just changing when we switch to the voiceless. Right when we when we let the voice drop, in the first case, if you say a little more enunciated, nice and clear, um, we go voice. So u a z, right? It's voice, 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 z, and then right when we're about to close into that two, we drop the voice because we don't want it to sound like a d, right? So z, 
There might be a little bit of it there as we close into the T, maybe. So we're choosing to switch to the voice list right before we close into the T. Or the second way is you can do the partial end of word devoicing where you say w, a, short z, and then just let that become an S, and then now you're already voiceless for the T. Ways to, it's another way, perfectly fine, nothing wrong with it. Both of those are perfectly acceptable. If you're clearly enunciating, you're probably not going to do the partial word devoicing, partial end of word devoicing. Um, but, but in this particular case, because the next word is the preposition to, we know that that T in two is very susceptible to change, right? If we say go to, we can change it to flap D, it turns go to, right? Because we have the vowel, vowel, start of an unstressed syllable, it flaps go to. All right. Now here, we're not going to flap because the sound before it is not a vowel, but because the sound before it is voiced, you can change the T in T into a D and make it a weak D instead. Ways to, three ways to understand, three ways to understand. So you keep that Z all the way through, no devoicing, change the T into the voiced version, which is a, light, a weak D, and then continue on. So you have three options there, okay? Z, T, Z, T, or Z, D. Again, because it's the preposition too. If it were a different word like time or something, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so do you have to? No, definitely don't have to. There's three options. Um, do words like contact, diphthong, online have that have primary and secondary stress have 50% of stress in each syllable or 60%? Okay, okay, interesting question. Uh, well, it's a good question, but I don't think your your examples are necessarily illustrations of that. Um, this is where the dictionary is useful for pronunciation. Double check. Okay, thought. Um, Okay, that's what I thought. And then your other example was online. Okay. Uh, yeah, so online, I, I would agree with that, that uh, online can have uh, the two stresses and there's a reason for that. But uh, the uh, more standard example I would use is baseball, where it's like a compound noun. Um, contact and diphthong only have one stress. Um, but the, the, the question, right, is if you have two stresses in a word, uh, where one is primary, one is secondary, what's the distribution? What's the percentage? Uh, and that's a good way to look at it. Um, now if it were 50% in each, then there wouldn't be a primary. It would be flat, right? Because if I'm doing stress, stress, it might as well, it, it could be unstress, unstress. Like it, it's, there's no difference between them if they're if they're equal, right? So the stress cancels out and then it's just flat. So it'd be like contact. Well, contact would, would uh, if I were to, to balance it out, that would be contact, how it would be. But if I say baseball, for example, so it's baseball, right? So baseball kind of bounces back up. If I switch that, I say baseball, it sounds a little weird, right? Um, so it's on base. But if I were to do 50-50, it would be baseball, baseball, baseball. It just sounds flat and robotic. Okay? So it's not going to be 50-50. Um, what the exact percentage is is a good question. I would probably I would probably say it's like either 60-40 or 70-30, somewhere in there. Uh, as, long as, as long as you have more on the primary... And then the secondary, the secondary usually doesn't matter as much. It can affect some things like the pronunciation of certain sounds. Um, but it, it, especially at the sentence level, um, when we're talking about like sentence level stress, it can easily get kind of like washed away a bit, we could say. Um, so the primary stress is definitely the most important and that needs to stand out. Um, but let's say you have like television Right, that has te, the, or tele, yeah, 
television. It's not television, right? That would be only one stress. There's two stresses there. But if you say television, that doesn't sound right. Okay. So it is important. You don't want to completely get rid of it necessarily, unless maybe you're speaking really, really quickly, but it should kind of, it's up and then it just bumps back up, maybe say halfway to where it was. So like if this is 100% stressed, this will be like maybe 50% stressed. And then the unstressed syllables are not stressed because they're unstressed. Um, so you can think of it that way maybe. Um, last sound in both A and I, but not in ow and oi, is a relaxed sound or dropped. Uh, oh wait, there's something before that. Um, did you say last time that in English, okay, that makes more sense, there's more context now. Um, there are four diphthongs, A, I, ow, and oi, and then fast, lazy speech, last sound in both A and I, uh, but not ow and oi, is a relaxed sound or dropped. Uh, so yeah, so I was talking about like eating diphthongs. Um, the, the last sound in A, which is the sound, same as the last sound in I and oi, um, in A in particular, we tend to, to drop that diphthong or, or cut the diphthong. We don't drop the whole sound, we drop the end of it. Um, you don't have to, we can do partially, it doesn't matter, but it's a common thing that happens. In I, um, it seems to be maybe a little less common, but it does happen, yes. Um, ow and oi, maybe I just haven't noticed as much or I haven't paid attention as much, but um, to me, if you try to drop the end of oi, like, what are you left with? You're left with O, oh, right? So that, that's kind of the problem where, like, the start of A only exists in the diphthong, right? It, it's, it, it doesn't exist. We have E, eh, but that's a different sound. It's very similar to the start of A, but it's not the same sound. Um, so it makes sense that it can maybe stand alone if we, you know, drop that second part. Um, so we can say de instead of, we don't say de. Right, de, that would be the monosong. But if we drop the end of a, we say instead of de, we say de, de, de. It sounds okay um, because it's not e, eh, it's its own little sound. Um, with i, again, the start of i and ow, it's not a, ah, it's very close and similar to a, ah, but it's not a, ah, it's not a. Ah, Okay, even the unmerged ah, it's 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 a separate sound. That sound in English only, or in American English at least, it only exists in the diphthongs I and ow. So at least as far as I is concerned, right, if you drop the, the end of the I, it kind of makes sense. Okay, we just have that last sound that doesn't exist by itself normally, so we could, would probably maybe interpret it as I. But then we have that same start of the sound shared by ow, Plus, ow has this lip rounding, which is very much important for that sound. You don't necessarily have to do it all the way. You can say like, ow, 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 right? It can be kind of sort of minimized or whatever. Um, but in general, especially if it's in a stressed syllable, you don't really want to do that. Um, so that's what I would I would say. Um, maybe there's just something I haven't really noticed. Uh and I would change my mind on certain things, but for A and I, starts the starts only exist in the diphthongs, so it makes sense that we can maybe drop the end. Ow and oi, we have some other things going on that make it harder to drop uh, the um, the ending. So, yeah. Um, now you can still maybe reduce them or make them uh, lazy. But dropping them completely, cutting that diphthong, uh, probably not. Okay, Anderson is very shocked by something. I don't know what I was talking about. <laughs> um, but uh, Sergio, welcome. Sorry it took me a second to get here. I see also Kyoto is here. Um, I'll get to you in a moment. I'm technically out of time now. But as I said, I do have a little bit of extra time today. So I'm going to try to finish this up. Um, and get to all the way down to Kyoto's uh, comment there. But um, we're going to try to wrap this up, guys, OK? Um, so Sergio says, is the TR cluster pronounced? <laughs> this is the third time this has come up in the live stream, I swear. Um, I'm just going to make a video about that, like a specific video, <laughs> um, like CHR, even when there's an S before the T. 
Okay, so good question. Good question. Um, is there or can there be? Because the answer is there can be. <laughs> um, remember, a lot of the, which it, there's nothing wrong with the questions themselves, right? Ask, ask the questions. But um, a lot of the questions that I get from you guys are formulated in a way that it's like yes or no. Like, is this true? When more often than not, um, the answer isn't yes or no. The answer is yes, but. <laughs> um, or just yes. Because uh, maybe it's interchangeable. It doesn't matter which one you use. Um, or if we say yes, but, right, if you're like, if you're like, you can say it this way, but if you're speaking really clearly and enunciated, then you wouldn't do that. Um, so there, there's still more than one option, but it might depend on the speed. Um, that's usually the case. There's usually more than one answer. Um, so can the TR cluster be pronounced like CHR or like TR, even when there's an S before the T? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, if you fully enunciate, strange, st 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 right? St now, part of the reason why the, the T before C8 or before R wants to become a CH is because notice what I'm doing there. St my ER is voiceless because in order for me to release the T and pull back into ER, I can't activate the voice yet. It's, it's, it's really awkward. St her, st her. Now, of course, when we're speaking, it happens really quickly and we don't really notice. But if I sort of break it down, it's it's awkward. But if I do ch, chur, 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 it's a lot easier to get that transition into the voice um, because the ch is sort of it kind of I get you know I don't want to say it. I want to say it takes up more space, which isn't the best way to, to put it compared to the t. T is just t, 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 where ch is like ch, ch, ch. It sort of seems like a takes up a little more space than a little t sound does. Um, and so it can sort of help fill that gap. And then the, the we can just add the voice to the er when we get to that position. If that's confusing, just forget it. But um, it's it doesn't matter if you say tr as tr or if you say tr as chur. In any case, they're interchangeable. It does not matter. I recommend saying chur partially because that's how I speak, but also partially because I do think that objectively it is relatively easier to do. Um, now, that might depend on your native language um, and uh, whatnot, but that's what I recommend. But either way, it doesn't matter. Now, if you put an S before it, nothing changes. Nothing at all changes. Um, in fact, you have another thing that can happen. So you can say strange, S-T-R. You can say strange, S-C-H-R, or... You can say strange with S H C H R. Now that one I don't recommend. There's nothing really wrong with it necessarily. It's just kind of like a lazier way to do the S there. You change it to an S H, um, and that has to do partially with the C H there. Um, if you try to do sh plus T R and say strange, that's just going to be weird. The the, the S H is going to be very clearly standing out, and it's it sounds like you're intentionally playing with the language. Um, but if you do the CH combination with the R and you do an SH in front of it, it is acceptable. It's perfectly fine. Um, I don't recommend it only because um, it's one way that can easily make you less clear. And doing the S still sounds perfectly natural and normal. That's the way that it's supposed to be. So we have a case where you could make a change, but it might make you harder to understand instead of something that you could make a change that would make you sound more natural, um, which is usually more often the case and you do want to make that change. Here, if it's easier for you to do the SH before the CHR, you can do it that way. It's fine. Don't worry about it. But um, if you can do a good S and then go into the CH, I recommend it because it's going to sound a little clearer. And as language learners, you do need a certain basic level of of clarity, right? Even if it's not super enunciated, because 
we're trying to focus on real speech, but you do still need that base level of, of understandability. Um, so that's just my two cents on it. Um, so there's actually three ways to say the STR combination, uh, where there's two ways to say the TR combination. Um, is it two ways? TR, so STR, SCHR, SHCHR, yeah, should be the three. Okay, anyway, uh, I've always had this doubt in this nothing for you is for fully pronounced because nothing is stressed in no and not stressed in the last single thing. Okay, so you're asking if for is fully pronounced, which you need the Y there, fully, not full. Um, you're asking if for is fully pronounced because of the stress in another word. Okay nothing to do with each other <laughs> nothing to do with each other um, at least the way that i'm understanding your question maybe i'm not understanding it exactly the same um, or is it a matter of style um full, full well i know what you mean but if you say full pronounced it's not correct it's grammatically incorrect and it's, it's that's what i'm saying you need to add the y um now you could say the full pronunciation right but if it's fully pronounced um the what will stress the four that in itself it has nothing to do with the words around it um that in itself may be a matter of style or whatever it's most likely going to be rooted in context um we're going to talk more about that uh, which oh yeah I, I just remember now that we got a bunch of people i was talking about the three types of intonation which now we're not going to get to you're gonna have to wait for the lesson but i just remembered i was talking about that um structural attentional and emotional intonation three types of intonation anyway we're gonna talk about that in the lesson um but if you say nothing for you okay so if i say um there's nothing for you okay it's like there, there, there's nothing here for me to give right like I, I don't have anything to give you there's nothing for you okay or if i say um there's nothing for you nothing for you nothing for you so i i can see where your question is coming from but it's not so much uh that you you like have to fully pronounce for or not it's like based on what nothing is doing um maybe based on a particular context that's relatively true like this is what nothing happens to be doing and this is what four happens to be doing based on the context and purpose of uh, what you're saying uh but it's not that like the nothing causes the four to be pronounced or not to be fully pronounced or not be fully pronounced um that that relationship doesn't really exist uh at least not directly the way that we're looking at it here like maybe in some other contextual way uh the only time again barring meaning like excluding certain contexts um or like certain purposes because that's what intonation is all based on why uh unstressed words might usually become stressed so aside from that the only time that you have to fully pronounce for there is one case where you don't have a choice. It always has to be fully pronounced as for instead of reduced to fur. And that is if it's at the end of uh, a sentence or a phrase, okay? Um, and the only reason for that, so if I say it's for you, it's in the middle, or I said the only reason for that, it's in the middle. If I say for what or for who, okay? You can say fur, you can say for or for, it doesn't matter. Usually it's gonna be fur, it almost always reduces. But if I say, who's it for? Okay. If I say, who's it for, for whatever reason, <laughs> I don't know the exact reason, but that sounds very uneducated. It just does. It just does. Um, I think probably um, I've noticed that when you have the last thing in a sentence, it needs to be clear. Um, and this, 
may not always apply. It, it's a tendency. It's not necessarily a solid rule, but I've noticed like, okay, four won't reduce to four. It has to be four. Otherwise it'll sound uneducated. Contractions. You can never end on a contraction. So if I say, um, uh, are you going to the party? You can't say, yes, I'm. It, it just, it, it sounds horrible and it sounds incomplete. If you say, yes, I'm going, that's fine. If you say, yes, I am, and you don't contract, that's fine. But if you say, yes, I'm, it sounds broken. Okay. So there's something about an end, the end of a sentence that wants us not to reduce or contract. Um, but then at the same time, like if I say, oh, hey, uh, do you want to go to the party? And you say, well, I want to. Okay, we're most likely going to say want to. But what if I say, well, I want to. I want to. See, want to almost always reduces to wanna. So maybe that's a special case where you can just keep the T and still reduce it at the end. Um, and maybe that's why. Because we know two is crazy. <laughs> um, so again, it's not necessarily a solid, hard, like 100% rule, which generally doesn't exist in English anyway. But there does seem to be this pattern uh, of what you want to avoid. I know that wasn't your question, but <laughs> useful information. Um, I noticed the difference in pronunciation in these sentences retracted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, make yourself at home to me. What is blog one? Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, based off of what I was saying. So like, so I was saying, so quote, make yourself at home, and that end quote. See, this is where quotations are useful because <laughs> I was thinking that was completely different, something completely different. Okay, so make yourself at home to me is blah, 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 versus you don't want to, okay, so to not stressed to me, versus you don't want to, to not stressed, talk to me, versus she's talking to, to stressed me. Okay, so I highly doubt that the two would be stressed in that last case. Can it be fully enunciated? See, being stressed and enunciated is not the same. Maybe that's part of the confusion here. Stressed and enunciated is not the same, or are, are not the same. <laughs> that's a different thing I'm going to talk about later. Um, but they're not the same, okay? So, for example, the the fully enunciated version of four is four. Fully enunciated version of two is two. Now, when if for if for some reason you stress a word like that, that is usually reduced. If you stress it, it's. I mean, you can technically still keep it reduced, kind of, but it, it's 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 kind of unnatural because when you're when you're stressing it you want it to be heard more. So we're naturally going to want to unreduce. Okay. So when you stress, if for some reason you stress four, if for some reason you stress two, if you have a special reason to do that, yes, you're probably not going to reduce it. But that doesn't mean that they're the same thing. You can still have unreduced four, which is, or not unreduced. Um, you still have reduced four, which is fur, and reduced two, which is tough. Um, that's not what I want to say. My brain is stopping. <laughs> I'm not working anymore. See, I went too far. I have to end the live stream. Um, you can have fully announced four. Announced. That's not even a word. Fully enunciated four and fully enunciated two. Okay. But they're not stressed. Because the fully enunciated version of a word is always possible. It's just especially for, for really common function words like this, it's very unlikely. It's a statistics game. It's not, again, it's not what does happen or what has to happen. It's what tends to happen. What is most common to happen? But at any given time, any, any time that you say four, right? Let's say you say the word four through, you know, your speech for the day, throughout the whole day. Let's say you say the word four 30 times, okay? If you're speaking naturally, like a native would, probably 20, 
25, 30%, 30, not percent, 20, 25 to say up to 29 of those fours are going to be pronounced fur. They're just going to come out as fur, unless four is at the end. We know it's a special case, whatever. Or if it's two, right? 20 of the 30, 25 of the 30, maybe 29 of the 30 are going to come out as t, right? As far as the vowel is concerned, uh, instead of ooh. But it's always possible. Maybe one of those 30 times or five of those 30 times, right? It doesn't matter. It's always possible that at any given time that you say two, it might come out as two instead of t. It's possible because that's the full pronunciation of the word, okay? Full pronunciation. Um, it's just usually we're not going to do that, okay? So uh, now, of course, again, the stress, if you stress it, that's one reason why it might not be uh, reduced, but you don't need the stress in order to not reduce it, okay? So for here, I could say, make yourself at home to me, to me, that's not stressed. Stress would be to me. Make yourself at home to me, okay? So make yourself at home to me. Make yourself at home to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. Neither is stressed, okay? If I say, um, well, want to, we'll probably turn into wanna anyway. We don't care. If you say she's talking to, okay? If I say she's talking to me, that's stressed. If I say she's talking to me, to me, that's not stressed. That's just fully enunciated, okay? There's a difference. Um I use the ng like in cinco or banco in words like singing. Uh, when I use the Spanish ng in English, I sound weird. The IPA screwed me up. Yeah, probably did. <laughs> I'm having a little bit of an existential crisis. I've been so wrong. I know that is one of the hardest parts of my job is that the more that I open people's eyes, like when I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, the more that I open their eyes to the... Um, we'll say insufficiencies of the IPA <laughs> um, and how they weren't taught how to like use their ears from the beginning, which is what you should do. Like, ear training is the single most important thing you should do when you start learning a language. Um, because of those things, they start to see, oh, <laughs> okay. So I always thought it was this way, especially if you have a teacher and especially if that teacher was a native, but you know, there's nothing wrong with non-native teachers. It's just when it comes to pronunciation, there's a lot of it, or even grammar. Um, there's a lot of information that is just wrong sometimes. I'm not saying in general. There's just like some non-native teachers that will either teach you outdated grammar rules, like never put a preposition at the end, or, you know, they, they say, oh, you know, the, this sound, like say the, the ooh sound is just like, say they're a Spanish speaker. They're like, oh, the, the ooh in English is just like the ooh in Spanish. Mm, it's not. <laughs> might seem that way to you because you're non-native and you haven't trained your ears, and then you're teaching to other people that it's the same sound. It's not the same sound, and so you, you know, spend five, ten years thinking it's the same sound, and then you come to me and you're like, oh, <laughs> it's not the same sound. I, yeah, I've been living a lie. Um, it sucks. This is one of the things I want to fix. I want to tell the world, hey, train your ears. Pronunciation is important. Ear training is important. This should be day one of any language class. You start training your ears. Day one, period, no excuses, I don't care. <laughs> anyway, that aside, um, yeah, so let's see here. This symbol and IPA, according to this page, since I still have it open. Okay, yeah, so mm, cinco, so cinco tengo. Um, now, to me, uh, I have not honed in on this particular sound between Spanish and English. Um, I've assumed that they're the same. Maybe I'm wrong. So when I'm speaking Spanish, if I say cinco, 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 sing, I'm just doing like I would say in sing, S-I-N-G, cinco, cinco. So maybe I'm wrong too. Um, I haven't listened to that specifically, so I, I can't tell you uh, if that's accurate or not. But um, you say that if you use the Spanish ng in English, that you sound weird. Uh, so I'm assuming that 
there is a little bit of a difference there. And what is that difference? What does that difference come down to? Because it, it is likely, um, remember with, oh, that's stupid. Um, I just saw something on here, which is like, you're insane. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So with the IPA, right, let, let's say if you're using it the way that you should be using it, which is just as an initial reference tool to sort of see what's new in the language compared to what you're used to. Um, and you go and you look at the symbols, right? You're going to see some symbols probably that are very different. And you're like, oh, okay, this is probably something completely new that's not in my language at all. Um, maybe it's something that's kind of similar, but it's different enough to get a different symbol. The IPA is usually good enough for that, right? What the IP is not good enough for, it seems, is um, the slight difference in quality, uh, which largely I think is is comes down to mouth posture. Um, but uh, so you might see in Spanish and English, oh hey, it uses the same IPA symbol for un, mm. and that might technically be true. They might between the two languages, they might be so close that there's almost no difference. Like the E sound, the E sound between languages is so similar that there's almost no difference, right? This it sounds almost the same in all languages. If you listen really, really closely, you'll notice that there is a little difference, um, but they sound almost the same. And that kind of sucks because it's good because you say, oh, okay, so this sound is at least close enough between my language and this new language that it gets the same symbol. Right. Don't assume that it's the same sound. That's that's the misleading thing about the IPA. It's it's telling you it's the same exact sound, probably with the same exact quality, but it's not. So don't think that. What, the way that you need to interpret that is if you see that same IPA symbol between languages, you want to assume not that they're the same, but that they're close enough to get the same symbol because the IPA doesn't seem to be good enough to separate out the quality. Um, and then... Based on that assumption, you need to go and you need to focus on training your ears to start trying to hear. Use minimal pairs, like between, say, cinco without the cut, the co at the end, like sing, and then the sing in English, right? If you can sort of isolate that as an audio file and listen to them side by side over and over and over again and start trying to hear what's the little difference. And maybe there is no difference. It's completely possible that between two languages, they're produced exactly the same. It's not likely. <laughs> But it's possible, especially if we're talking about between American English and some other language, because American English tends to be more open and many languages tend to be more closed. That is probably the single biggest factor that's probably going to cause a little difference. Um, but if you're going, say, like from Spanish to French and you both have that same symbol, it's maybe a little more likely that it, it could be exactly the same. Um, so you really want to go in and focus on your ears. And if you just, you know, you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep training those ears massive amounts and you still hear no difference, it's likely there's no difference. And they, they do happen to be the same between the two languages. Um, but you've got to go in and try to train yours first. Don't just assume that what the IPA is telling you is correct because it's likely not. Um, anyway, that aside, uh, can you talk about dropping the personal pronouns of sentences? Uh, I've touched a little bit on that in the live before. I heard people doing it instead of saying, like, I saw her there, I love you, they saw, or they say, saw her there. Yeah. Um, so simple explanation. It's just an informal way to speak. That's it. Um, and it, it's, in a lot of cases, it might, it might depend on the context. It's not that it sounds like super informal necessarily, but it does sound more informal. Um, so like, uh, oh, hey, uh, did, uh, did, did Megan go to the party? It's like, I ah, saw her there. So yeah, she went, <laughs> right? Saw her there, saw her there. It just sounds more informal. It sounds, it sounds a little, a little rough kind of for some reason, uh, which makes it sound a little, a little informal. It's, it's almost like it's, it's a little direct when you drop that pronoun. Um, I don't know, but that's all it is. So uh, if you're, if you don't want to sound, you know, more informal, uh, which we generally speak quite informally anyway, but if you don't want to sound that little extra informal, uh, just keep the pronoun. 
right? If you're talking to a friend or, you know, whoever, and it doesn't really matter. I mean, like if you did it like all the time, like if you always drop the pronoun, even talking to like a friend or something, it's probably going to start to get a little weird because um, we don't do it like 100% of the time, right? Uh, but it, it exists in more of that informal speech. So just throw it in every once in a while. You know, don't speak that way all the time. Just, you know, you can drop the pronoun, <laughs> basically. Uh, how to pronounce at in sentences. Okay, so this is the last question. Um, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, I see where your question is coming from. Um, it depends. <laughs> As is usually the answer. Fully enunciated, we have at. We have at plus t, at, right? So at like in cat. That's fully enunciated. It can always potentially come out that way. Um, at, I don't think, I don't think it tends to reduce as much as say like two or four does. Um, but number one, we have the lazy a, which sounds very similar to e. Eh. Um, so instead of at, right? Which we don't usually use the fully enunciated at anyway. We tend to use the lazy a, but instead of at, we say at, at. Eh, eh, eh. It's still an eh, it's not eh. Eh, eh. It just sounds very similar to eh. Um, if you're speaking maybe on the faster end of normal, um, you can maybe reduce it to eh. It, it. Um, so at what time? At, at what time? At what time? At what time? Possible. Um, you can maybe even reduce it to a schwa in really fast speech. Uh, but like I was saying earlier, what if it's the last word in the sentence? If I say, um, when is it at? And you try to say, when is it at? Nope. 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 Just like you can't say, who is it for? It sounds very uneducated. Okay. I say, who is it for? Um, two again is a little bit of a special case there, but at, you know, if it's the last word, say at. Okay. You can still use the lazy at, but um, funny. I'm funny, really. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, but you, 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 you don't want to reduce it to eh or, or something else. Um, it still needs to be an ah sound. And then in the flow of speech, it kind of depends on how fast you're speaking. If you're nice, clearly enunciated, it's going to be ah, whether that's lazy or not, probably more ah, more open. If it's really clearly enunciated flow of normal speech, reduce to lazy, ah, reduce to eh, um, maybe more than that in really fast speech. And it kind of depends on the sounds around too. Like um, I was saying, like uh, at what time? At what time? At what time? Notice I'm not saying the T. I'm not saying at what. Okay, at what? At what? At what? And that has to do with some other linking rules and things that can happen. So um, it, there's you can't just look at one single word and say how is this word pronounced? Because like you know how it's pronounced individually, obviously. Like you can just go look that up, but. You can't just say like, how is this word always pronounced in every sentence? Because it's not always going to be the same answer, especially for these function words. Um, when you have content words, especially one syllable content words like dog, that's generally consistent. You're going to have a d, you're going to have a ah, you're going to have a g. Maybe the g is stopped and you say dog instead of dog. Okay, you don't push out the, the g. Two possibilities there but it's a little more stable. And that's because it's a content word. It's a one syllable content where we need to hear that word. Okay. It needs to be generally clear. A lot of these function words, like the prepositions, they're just like the, the glue that shows the relationship between words um, and stuff. And so they tend to uh, get reduced, right? Maybe the T can drop, maybe the vowel can reduce to a schwa or potentially disappear in some cases, depending on what uh, word we're talking about and, and what's going on around it, how fast you're speaking. So it gets complicated, unfortunately, but that's real speech. And you have to understand that. I wish it were simpler. I wish we just always spoke one way and it was really easy to learn and really consistent, but that's not real speech, unfortunately. Um, learning. Okay. I do have to go. How to understand that a word has the schwa sound? Are there any specific rules on how to detect it? Yeah. Train your ears. Train your ears. Um, okay, I do have to go. No more comments, no more questions. I will quickly respond to this because I have a short answer. Um, I don't know if you've seen my lesson on the, um, the full range of the schwa sound, or I think it's called the truth about the schwa. 
truth about the schwa in American English. I could probably link that, but you just look it up because I don't have time to go look for it right now. Um, but if you look that up, you'll probably find it. Um, I talk about the full range of the schwa sound within the context of American English. It goes all the way from uh, which is nice and reduced, to uh, which is sort of a clearer schwa, which would also be the center of gravity for the mouth posture for the whole language uh, in American English. And then there's the upside down B, which is more like uh, 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 kind of like that. Um, and Americans don't really make a distinction between a uh and a uh and a. Uh. It, it, we kind of tend to use it. So cut could be cut, cut, or if you're speaking really quickly, cut. Cut. It's just uh, it's just a little schwa sound. So it's in American English is actually the range of one sound. Um, and it just depends on how clearly you're saying it. So, uh, and then potentially at the ultimate logical end of the range, it's completely dropped, where it, the the vowel gets eaten and it just disappears completely. Um, but it's based around uh. Okay, you're gonna hear some sort of whether it's ah, uh. uh uh, that's sort of that middle center of gravity um, until it gets to completely dropped. Um, so upside down B, center of gravity, reduced schwa, disappeared. Right. And I'm talking about like mouth is more open. Uh, uh, uh. And then, I mean, you're not just like going to close your mouth. You're just not going to say the sound, right? It sort of disappears. Um, so go watch that video if you haven't. Uh, and then focus on your ears. At the end of the day, that's that's what you got to do. Um, don't, especially for pronunciation, when we're talking about sounds. I don't care what the rules are. The rules aren't going to help you. Okay, rules will not help you. They might. Some rules might help a bit. Some rules are very useful. But for the most part, especially when it comes to perceiving the sound, how to understand that a word has the schwa, you have to hear it. Right. Like I mean, you can go look it up in the dictionary. Sure, maybe. Like if it's accurate. And it'll say, oh, here's the, the symbol. But you need to perceive it. Train your ears. Train your ears. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you guys very much. I do have to go. Um, good stream. Had a rocky start, but uh, turned out to be a good one. So anything else I want to say? Yeah, stay tuned for the intonation lesson. Um, I'm hoping to have it out by the end of this week. It's a really big lesson. And... The more, the deeper I dig, the more I kind of, I start to realize things. I start to, uh, and then I run into complications and all that stuff. I'm like, oh, so I'm putting it together. I'm working on it. Don't worry. Um, I'm probably going to do another like little minimal pair extra practice lesson in between. So there's something posted, but um, that's the next big lesson coming. Just hang tight for that. And I'll see you next week here, Sunday, same time, 1130 California time. So see you guys later. Yes. Ciao, Fernando. Um, you're welcome, Leonid. And yeah, bye-bye.